Hello and welcome to Preprints in Motion, a podcast taking a deep dive into the fast-paced world of preprints. Join us as we sit down with early career researchers, discuss their latest preprint and find out about their journey through the muddy marshes of academia. Hit that subscribe button, leave a rating and find us on Twitter at MotionPod. Support us by heading over to buymeacoffee.com slash preprints. But for now, let's get into the show. This week we have some friends from Sheffield, Alex and Kavitha, discussing tannocytes and the hypothalamus. For once, it's a full house. We've got John with us for the first time. In I am, ages. yeah. After a long break of not being uh, in front of the microphone and only only being present in editor overlord form, I am mm. actually back in front of the microphone. And we'll us. cut all that out, so it'll be like you were never here. It's, I it's I will not yeah. be cutting that out. Don't you worry. <laughs> um, and we're, we're joined by people we actually know today. I don't know if you're friends of the podcast because I don't know if you listen, and I'm not going to put you on the spot, so you don't have to answer that. I know Alex listens. Oh, Alex listens. listens. Oh, at least one. <laughs> but you are friends. We are friends, yes. There you go. We'll settle on you are friends. Yes, that's better. So we because when we have multiple guests on, I think it's it's nice to, to let people introduce themselves because it saves me doing it. It saves me a job. So I guess why don't you each sort of give us a little bit of who you are, maybe what you're currently doing. So Kavitha, maybe maybe you want to go first. Hi, I'm Kavitha. So I'm a postdoc in Professor Marisha Blatchett's lab. And um, i basically from India came here to do my master's PhD and I haven't moved out of Sheffield at all since then so I've been stuck in this building Perth Court is my <laughs> forte I think so there's worse places to be stuck right it's a beautiful building uh, that is that is very true Perth Court is very beautiful so yeah I am here post talking with Marisha at the minute and Alex Hi, yeah. So uh, I go way back with some of you. Uh, me and Emma first met in 20, 2010 when we did our undergrads together in, in, in Sheffield and both continued there doing PhDs. You just told everyone how old Emma is. <laughs> Sorry. How dare you? <laughs> Sorry. And so I uh, did my PhD in Sheffield with the other people on the call. <laughs> uh, at the time, when I did my PhD, I was working in Mauritius Lab work with Ethan Hours, and I was joined to be by Marisha Plachek and Andy Furley, who are two of the senior authors on the paper that we're here to discuss today. And then after my PhD, I decided to move out, and I'm now a operational research analyst in the civil service, uh, doing all kinds of different types of researchy things there. Which you might be coming on a separate podcast to talk about when I eventually get around to doing that, maybe. There's a long list of things that I'm currently working on that are not progressing at all. Um, so Alex, everyone missed the bit that we've going to have cut out, but Alex did the sensible thing and got out of academia. We're all now desperately trying to follow him out. Hopefully we'll get there. So let's start with somebody giving us a little bit of an overview as to the preprint we're talking about today. So we all understand what we're doing or what we're looking at. Who wants to do it? Who's feeling brave? Who recently read the preprint again? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Alex. Your, your, your name is first on the list. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, we are joint co-authors. We joined, joined first authors on the paper. We should point out for everyone listening. Uh, but yeah, no. So um, I was going to say I started this research, but I didn't start this research. It actually started based on previous research from the lab by uh, in Stuart and Sarah Robbins, who are also co-authors. And then also Sarah Brown, who I've got to represent because Sarah Brown did PhD at the same time as me in the same lab, but not on this project anymore. This project was um, started off as part of a master's project looking at stem cells in the hypothalamus. And to kind of take it back to the very basics. I've got to talk about what the hypothalamus is. And so for anyone out there who doesn't know about it, that's fine. Uh, it's a small part of the brain that's found in the very center at the very bottom, which means it's a really ancient part of the brain. And it sits in the center at the bottom around what we call the third ventricle, which is the third of four uh, fluids filled spaces in the brain called ventricles. Um, these contain cerebral spinal fluid that flows throughout the brain and all the way down the spinal cord. And sitting below the hypothalamus is, uh, or coming from it, is the pituitary stalk, which leads into the pituitary gland. And together, the hypothalamus and the pituitary are involved in regulating homeostasis for the body. And so this is how we keep things the same during the body, whether that's thinking about feeding behavior or, or aggression or thirst or sleep or uh, reproductive aspects as well. There's many, many different things that these, these two parts of the brain control. And so about 20 years ago now, must be, the first study came out identifying that there was a group of stem cells in this part of the brain called the hypothalamus. Um, and so these are cells that kind of align the ventricle, that fluids filled space in the middle. And they have these really long processes that stick out into the brain tissue around. We already knew they interacted with neurons there and they also interact with the blood vessels in a bit at the bottom of the hypothalamus. And uh, these specialized health cells are called tannocytes. And so about 20 years ago, someone, uh, a granola group, figured out that maybe there was a stem cell or progenitor cell population 
uh, there, uh, which could give rise when prompted to a variety of different cell types, including new town sites, as well as um, neurons and astrocytes and other cells of the brain, both in development and then in adulthood as well. And so this was this work was continued by other labs, including including our lab. And so in this paper, what we're doing was we expanded upon what we understand about these telocytes as stem cells. We looked at characterizing them with a variety of markers from the front to the back of the hypothalamus, because it turns out there's a lot of changes through there that aren't well characterized in the previous literature. We also identify a new marker for these telocytes called Enarcam, which is a cellular adhesion molecule. Uh, so it sits on the surface of the cell, attaches stuff together, but also seems to be involved from our research in regulating the differentiation, proliferation and neurogenesis that these telocytes are involved in um, in postnatal mice. Yeah, I think I covered everything. <laughs> I, I think that was good. You aimed it at my level, which is always good. And yeah. you did give me flashbacks to undergrad. So I might start and go and sit in a corner and shake for a little bit. But... <laughs> Other than that, I think that was good. I, I would have said he aimed it even at my level. I anything <laughs> above even cells I struggle with. Just give me give me some gooey protein or DNA in a test tube. I, I don't want to hear about anything higher order than that. So yes, no, very very nicely explained. We're still very complimentary here. So you you mentioned tannocytes there, um, which are cells I knew nothing about, despite knowing you for so long. I, I turns out I didn't ever listen when you spoke about what you did. <laughs> <laughs> I read your paper and I was like, how did I not know about this? I literally <laughs> known Alex since 2010. We did a 15 opposite each other. And <laughs> That's the thing. Hypothalamus so, does so much important things and nobody seems to know what it actually does because that, that's what is controlling all your main physiological everyday behavior and people don't care about it. There you go. Here we are to talk more about it. I mean, I, I hear neuroscience and I check out. It's too difficult for me. But that's a good that's a good stopping point for the next question, actually. So the hypothalamus is this sort of master organ, I guess, that regulates so much and does so many different things. So where do the tannocytes that you've been looking at fit into that whole process? Are these things that are ultimately turning into cells that are involved in all of the different things that the hypothalamus can do? Or are these kind of like already down a specialized lineage? They are a specialized lineage. And um, obviously, they're not going to contribute to all of the hypothalamic functions but they do play a very important role because they're mainly lined along the, like like he said, it lines the third ventricle and then it feeds into your median eminence. So they act almost like a gatekeeper cells between your body and your brain. So they are the ones who are going to communicate, um, you know, sending hormones and other metabolites to your body and then collecting the levels back and sending it back to your brain to say what's high and what's low. So they pretty much like they are the barrier and they are the interface between your body and your brain. And they can differentiate into astrocytes, glial cells, and some neurons. So, yeah, that's how they regulate all these functions. Yeah, so that was, that was what I was going to ask next, is uh, what makes them so special? Everything. They do everything. everything. <laughs> they do everything, <laughs> obviously. They seem, they seem to do a lot of stuff. Yeah, um, they're, they're very, I would be biased, but I think they're really cool cells. And how did you go about studying them? Is this all in vivo? Did you do some cell culture? Can you cell culture? So we didn't do any real-time in vivo work because it's really hard to look inside the brain of a mouse while it's yeah. alive. So unfortunately, there were some sacrifices made. But a lot of the work that I did was involved in um, looking at very thin slices of mouse brains with um, immunofluorescent markers on them. So to light them up in really pretty uh, red, green, and blue pictures. Which are great for a podcast. People yeah, I know. <laughs> podcast format. Trust us, it's beautiful. Go, go and read the preprint and the paper. Go and read them. <laughs> We're always doing this. We're always picking image-heavy preprints and then saying how wonderful the images are. And it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> we should learn. It worked really well in my thesis because I didn't really have to write anything. I just put loads of pictures in, but it doesn't work so well. Uh, it works well on the paper as well, but even though you have limited numbers of figures uh, and it's really hard to fit everything on the one page yeah. for a figure. Mm -hmm. But um, it, uh, it doesn't work so well for a podcast, but we'll do our best. But you've got lots of pretty pictures. We have got lots we of pre pictures. If anyone's interested yes. in pre pictures, go and have a look. Screensavers. Yep, they make great screensavers. In fact, my favourite is a a picture of a molecule called Sonic Hedgehog, which is my, one of my favourite molecules. Um, it's a picture of Sonic Hedgehog in the in an embryonic brain uh, in a pattern that looks like a heart. And so <laughs> I really like like it's a good it's a good Valentine's Day uh, card cover if anyone's interested. <laughs> I know what your girlfriend's getting now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. She gets it every year. She's sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I did a lot of immunofluorescence as well as doing some, um, for the people who know a lot about different types of techniques, I did a lot of um, in situ hybridization as well, looking at different markers. And then um, we also did various different types of cultures as well. We did neurosphere cultures, which uh, um, we can get onto in a bit. They're kind of they're like organoids, 
where you grow cells in suspension. I know you've had people talking about organoids before, uh, but they're very basic ones. They're just cells that grow into balls and then you have a look at them. And then we did other ones which are like called uh, slice cultures, where you take a thick slice of the brain and then try and culture it and keep it alive and see what happens over time. And so we did things like um, showing that uh, when you when you take these slices from near the ventricle where the tenocytes are, they don't have any um, dopaminergic neurons there. But then when you culture them for a few days, you get new dopaminergic neurons and you seem to get more in, in brains from wild type mice than normal mice compared to mice where you've removed the anarchan. And then we did some other cool experiments as well, looking at single cell sequencing and things. So this phenotype we were looking at was very subtle. So we tried to approach it for as many different angles as possible <laughs> to prove that it existed. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's true. It's really, really difficult. Good for us. Everything coincided and all the results cells told us the <laughs> same thing. So there you go. Yeah, it, it's super difficult looking at things that are subtle changes in science. It's, um, I think it gives you a real appreciation for how difficult science really is. Because you do, you do have to look at it from every possible angle just to be certain of what you're seeing. So maybe Kavitha, you could jump in now with the single cell stuff, because I think maybe maybe I'm horribly wrong, um, but you you did, you were responsible for a lot of that side of things. So yeah, so, so this was after Alex, I think he left the lab. So it was after his PhD period. So that's when I came back to Mauritius lab and she wanted to continue on this work. So we started dissecting out the hypothalamus. So basically what we do is like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with single cell RNA sequencing or... I mean, I'm a, I'm about to do some. So give give me a quick overview so I can learn something quick that's useful overview. for me. So what's, what's going to happen is like, you take your tissue of interest in our case, which is the hypothalamus. And mainly we focused on the median eminence region. So not the entire hypothalamus, obviously. So the region that we speak about about in the paper and we take them and we dissociate them into single cells basically and then collect RNA from them and then sequence it basically and what you're going to get is like a map of your different genes that are expressed in every single cell and yeah so then they go through lots of clustering analysis and we have to be honest we didn't do the bioinformatics ourselves so our collaborators in uh, john hopkins set black Shoes lab they're the one they are like the experts in it so what we do is we dissect the tissue make all the single cells and then send it to them and they actually do the sequencing and everything for us send us back these beautiful new maps which has got like these pretty dots and we can like a user-friendly software called loop file, which you just go click on your gene of interest and then it just shows like which clusters show your genes of interest, any genes for that matter, just like you know, addition molecules or neurogenic genes or like astrocytic genes or all of that sort. And then what they do is actually cluster these cells into different populations based on their uh, differential gene expression. And then you can say, okay, this gene is upregulated in this set of population cells. This gene is upregulated in different sets and that's how we compare between our wild type and in our cam knockout mice so what we have done in the paper is so we have collected the median eminence region from both your control wild type glutamates and your NRCAM knockouts and we have compared all the different talisitic genes and different astrocytic markers and what set back actually um thomas who's done active sequencing and clustering analysis he's actually clustered them into the different subsets of tannocytes and seen what markers are upregulated or downregulated between your controls versus your nrcam knockouts and also he's looked at different neurogenic markers astrocytic markers and what we see is we see a reduction in tannocytes in these nrcam knockouts and we also also see a reduction in TRH genes and different genes that are important for your thyroid metabolism. So that was really cool, we thought. And then we have another set of collaborators who did the behavioral studies, and uh, they have shown that there is a modest reduction in like food intake and also a significant reduction in body weight only after like about eight weeks of development. They don't see any difference in body weight or food intake earlier on during the postnatal period. Really good lesson there in the importance of good collaboration. I know, they um, are, they're really good. They did their jobs and they just gave it back to us and we, <laughs> <laughs> we did our job, so yeah. I think that's what you want with single cell data. Exactly. So, uh, here's my samples. Because yeah, it, it is, you. to be honest, it is complicated. Um, hands up, we are not bioinformaticians and no clue how things mm. are done back then. So they're like really useful. So, so one of the things that you've both now mentioned, and we should maybe take a little step back and explain, is the NRCAM. So could you explain what that is and what, what why you think it's important? <laughs> this is what we really need Andy on the call. <laughs> <'cause>, uh, <laughs> yeah, we should have put Andy in the call. <laughs> like one of the senior authors, Andy Foley, the cell gene molecules are like his thing he's been really keen on for years looking at all kinds of all kinds of different systems uh, and so one of his previous papers that kind of informed the way in which we approached some of this was looking at how like i mentioned before sonic hedgehog 
but also the sonic hedgehog signaling pathway interacts with an RCAM in the cerebellum to guide how the layers of the cerebellum are set up during development. Uh, and so basically what it turns out that you've got all these you've got all these molecules that stick on the surface and stick stuff together, but actually they're also involved in modulating signaling pathways and doing all kinds of other cool stuff to change cell behavior. And that actually they're important in different things as well. So while an RCAM is on top of these tan sites and it might be sticking them together, there are also a, a variety of other adhesion molecules on top of the tan sites. But it's possible that perhaps an RCAM is involved in sitting on the surface of these cells, but it, it, might, it might be it might be involved in like changing how they communicate with each other as well, whether that's for direct contact communication or it could be through signal pathways or other cell adhesion molecules are involved in being at the nodes of Ronvier in in like peripheral nerves. So like guiding how electrochemical signals spread across nerves to transmit uh, signals in nerves as well. And so there's we don't know what the mechanism is for what they're doing, but they seem to be doing something. And so the next one of the next steps is to kind of like look a bit mechanistically at what it's doing. But yeah, really what it is, is it's just a cool molecule that sits on the surface and sticks stuff, but then maybe does some other stuff as well. How did you get on to looking at that? Did it pop up in the sequencing data or was it before that? This was really early. Yeah, yeah. So was, this was this was very early and so I think like I said Andy has been looking at these molecules in various different systems for years whether that's in the peripheral nervous system or in the cerebellum and so there was some research that shows that cell adhesion molecules are uh, like are upregulated in certain types of cancers um, and seem to promote like motility and proliferation and, and things that make them more carcinogenic and like Andy's other work is looking at how sonic hedgehog makes proliferation and differentiation happen in the cerebellum and so there's a thought well maybe one of the cell adhesion molecules we're interested in is involved in here as well. There's been some very, very basic literature from a couple of decades ago that suggested it was present in the hypothalamus. So we wanted to know where it was present and whether it was on the whether it was on the cells. And lo and behold, like we, um, so Sarah Brown, who was doing this for a master's, tried a few uh, and found that an RCAM just happens to like label mostly tannocytes in the hypothalamus. It might also be on some astrocytes, but you know it, it's mostly it's mostly the tannocytes, and so it turns out it's actually a pretty good marker. It's a pretty good marker for these cells as well. So it was a bit of a shot in the dark that worked out, uh, and then found some interesting stuff based on it as well. Always nice, which is basic research. This is how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So Mauritius Lab does a lot of developmental stuff. So what, what what are you looking at in terms of this? What stage of development are you looking at? Is this something that's on early on or is this something that kind of more important when we're adults? The work that we've done in the paper is mainly looking at adult mouse, so between six to eight weeks old mm. mice. But most of the other lab work is like in embryonic chick development, like quite early in development mm. to see actually how these tannocytes or how these different neurons are specified or set up during development. That's what we're currently focusing on. But the other part is to see in the adults to see what these cells go on to become and how they are maintained through life mm. and over a life course of things. Do the levels of the cells fluctuate or an RCAM actually on the cells fluctuate with development or is it quite steady until these the sort of cells are needed? Am I asking the important questions? I love it when that happens. <laughs> Actually, because like even in our study, if you see, I don't think we see much difference in the NRCAM between your wild type and NRCAM knockouts in your uh, embryonic stages. It's mainly in mm. postnatal periods, it sets off the difference actually. So I think it plays a major role in terms of stem cell proliferation differentiation in more the other part of your life than during development. Would you agree, Alex? Yeah, I think so. So we don't really know about the levels of expression in the cells. I don't exactly. think it's really been done is looking at whether there's more or less expressed at different times. We know that it kind of starts, I think, about embryonic day 14. Mm. Like So the, so um, mouse have a 21 day um, development. Gestation. Like embryonic development. And then, and then there's yeah, gestation. That's the right word. Thank you. Kavita. <laughs> and then um, like they, they do a lot of postnatal development as well. So like, just like, just like humans, except uh, we, uh, yeah, we, we do a bit of development inside the womb and then we do a bit of development outside as well. And so our research suggests there are some, there do seem to be some differences quite late in, in, in the embryonic development. Um, but really the main differences seem to be later on in well, we we looked at late embryonic and in adulthood and we haven't really looked at the time in between because of <laughs> like it's, it's so hard <laughs> it takes up so much time and money to do, to do all this stuff and so that would be one thing to look at is when when did these effects happen one hypothesis is that it's uh it could get just get worse over time like it could be that you just like tannocytes fail to if they don't have an arcam they fail to produce more tannocytes and, and more neurons and other things that we looked at in the adult um, over time. And so one thing we wanted to do, but didn't get around to doing was looking at aged mice and looking at 
like is there an even more severe phenotype in in really old mice but like that was my next question yeah. Yeah. but then to do that you have to you have to grow enough mice for two or three years and then and then have a look and like and so you can't really do that until you know what you're looking for so you kind of have to have done all the other experiments before you even start doing that yeah. so you know it's yeah. um it's tricky it's one of the whole reasons that it's really hard to look at models of aging generally in in animals especially in um, mice i think so yeah, yeah. I, I I have a question. How dare you? I can I know, I know, I know. Well obviously I I know you can you know, it's it's very easy to do things like CRISPR knockouts and RNAi knockdowns in like insects, but in a in a in a mouse with something like that, you know, midlife, is it possible to do that kind of especially in the brain as well? Like is it possible to do that sort of thing where you know you kind of knock out or down NRCAM, for example, kind of, you know, when they're sort of already more or less fully developed and see if it makes any difference then or during development? Is that have you got tools to do that? I, I have no idea. Yes, we do. We have all these pre-lock systems, so we can switch on and switch off genes whenever you want. And you can basically drive them with the promoter of your gene of interest, specific to your hypothalamus or any other part for that matter. And then you can switch it on or switch it off and look at the gain of function, loss of function, etc. So it is doable. But the NRCAM knockout mice that we have looked at in this paper is like a normal one. I don't think it can do all these um, timely knock-on, knock-off effects. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think it was first developed in about the year 2000. I think the paper it was in was 2001. Uh, and so it's a, it's not, I think, if we told, uh, if we told our, like the senior authors that it was old school, they might disagree. But to me, it seems pretty old school. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's a pretty old school way of developing a knockout with like, which is just from <laughs> If anyone's managed to listen this far and hasn't figured out yet, it's um, it's where you remove a gene so it's no longer expressed. And so this is what we did with an RCAM. And so, um, but there are much more modern ways of doing it. So like Kavitha was saying, you can introduce systems that can, you can be turned on at specific times. You've also got systems like CRISPR that allow you to like much more accurately target stuff or you could you could try lots of different things but doing it with mice is quite difficult because you need to first of all target the right place and then they only have a litter of about between like three and eleven pups at a time five to eight yeah, yeah it's yeah. usually about five to eight and so then you need enough then you need to like genotype them make sure you've got the right genotypes and then you need to breed them and growing up a colony takes a long time and like if it takes 10 weeks for them to this the same take weeks yeah, exactly. <laughs> it takes eight weeks to get to the point where they can breed again. Then you know it takes a long time, and so setting up a new uh, a new genetic model takes takes a long time. It's pretty much a PhD. It takes a whole PhD. Uh, it's definitely easier now than it used to be, but it's um it, it's tricky. And so I was quite happy to go ahead and work with this mouse line that we already had, which is another great convenient thing about working on these molecules that Andy been interested in for years was we already had the mouse line. I think that's one of the things we actually recommend in the paper is like you could do some kind of inducible knockout where you could look at you mm -hmm. could turn off an RCAM at a specific time and then see what happened. It would be great to do, but time and money are, are considerations involved there. I mean, conveniently, if anyone wants to go and find out more about conditional knockouts in mice, we did an episode on that not that long ago. Uh, with a system that lets you turn a gene back on after you've turned it off. John, maybe yeah, you should really cool. listen, to that, listen to that. Yeah, John. What, yeah, come on, John. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I'm not sure it was in mice. I think it was cell-based, wasn't it? Yeah, that was a cell thing, wasn't it? Um... Either way, it was really not... cool. <laughs> I think you can. I think you can probably still. You could. You could. You could. You'd probably apply. Sure, there'd be a way. There'd be a way. Yeah, yeah. There'd probably be a way. I also listen to the average episodes so many times in little chunks while I'm actually editing it that all the all the meaning of the words just disappears completely. So it might well have been <laughs> just, in that episode, but out. I don't know. I, you know, yeah. I listen to each episode yeah. ten times, but in like ten second repeated chunks. So you know. <laughs> so the obvious question that people always ask when you do things that are not in humans, as if we're all meant to be studying humans all the time, is what's the human relevance here? Do you still find these cells in humans? Are they functioning in the same way? Obviously, humans have tanocytes, and um, that's how they function. It is important, like I said, because tanocytes are important for various metabolic functions. So you would assume that when you get old, where you you know lose all your metabolic physiological functions, there is a reason behind it. So that's one of the reasons why you tend to get all these um, difficulties when you age. So, so the present humans, are you planning to look at different sort of diseased states, either in mice or with, with human samples? Because I mean, the obvious ones I would think of are things like Alzheimer's or potentially Parkinson's. That's on the list, but not in the immediate future. So the current grant, like I said, the current work in the lab is mostly focused on developmental biology, looking at the hypothalamus development during embryonic stages. I might probably writing some fellowship or something in future. I'm not revealing much. <laughs>
I think you can you can keep the fellowship yeah, stuff secret. secret. It's only mine. Secret. Yeah, but yeah, that's that's the plan. We want to write because like like we don't have current grants funding for like you know mouse work or anything. So we would like to like write mm. put in a grant to do that, which would be quite interesting because especially with this yeah. connection with all these um, neurodegenerative and metabolic diseases. So it'll be lo- cool cool to look at and also make some collaborations with people who already have these kind of cool mice. Probably mm. that would be an easiest option rather than us reinventing the wheel yeah f- from my perspective as someone who's not in the lab anymore i can pretty much <laughs> i can say oh i would lo- I'd love to do all kinds of stuff and, and i wouldn't i wouldn't be involved but no really i think one of the one of the cool things that we did was no one had shown that um these town sites give rise to dopaminergic neurons in the hypothalamus before there's a couple of different dopaminergic populations there and we show that one of the populations is reduced when you remove an arcam and if and you look in the adult mice they have a reduced dopaminergic neuron population and so I don't know if this if, if this population is normally affected in something like Parkinson's disease, but it'd be really cool to have a look to see whether whether there was that effect, but then also, you know, whether an Arkham did anything. But I mean, I think it'd be really hard because this, the phenotype is already so subtle and the hypothalamus under normal conditions seems to produce new neurons so slowly that I don't even know whether you could even like look at it at a, at a reasonable time scale. But it would be really cool to have a look at that that kind of thing. Do we know? I mean, we have to bring Emma in here, bring the expert in. But do we know if um, different subpopulations of dopaminergic <laughs> neurons are um... dopaminergic? <laughs> Thank you. Um, do we know if the, the sort of subpopulations at play? I imagine they, or is it just like a blanket? Things go wrong. I don't. The thing is, I don't know specifically about the cell type that Alex is talking about. I was actually quite surprised that, to hear that they turned. I can't say it. Tanya site. <laughs> that they turned. Uh... Tanya site. <laughs> What is it? Tanocyte. Tanocyte. There we go. Mm, I think I've been good. typing Tanya site in all the producer notes. <laughs> <laughs> you have, and it's been so confusing. Sorry, Alex. Uh, Alex, if you ever do drag, then I think Tanya site has to be your uh, drag name. I'm, uh, I'm christening you here and now. <laughs> Tanya site. I'll bear that in mind. I'm just just make some notes. <laughs> um. Anyway, I I wasn't aware that Tanya site. <laughs> um, made dopaminergic neurons but i i know that vaguely in like the substantia niagara parts and factors the main area that's affected and there are different subpopulations of dopaminergic neurons like even when we do our ipsc differentiation you get different subpopulations and we look at the one that's closest to the one the main group that's affected but there's other little groups as well okay so it could it could be having a role but it's not it's not look i don't know how closely it's located to the like the the substantia niagara pass compactor which is the main area affected in parkinson's disease i'm guessing it's not not closely not closely so i mean it could but i would say alzheimer's is more likely because that affects the entire brain and just kind of shrinks it it's crazy (laughs) Yeah, and so I think um, very little is known about how just generally there's only like three or four, four I guess if you include the hypothalamus, which you should. Uh, I guess there's only there's only four different um, known neural stem cell niches in in mammals, and we know even less about how they work in humans as well. And so like there's one thing trying to look at these in in like mouse and fish and fly models of these neurodegenerative diseases, and other ones trying to look in in humans, which live for many many times longer. And so um, I think it's it's difficult. It's, it's it's so hard i don't i don't envy people working <laughs> on neurodegeneration because it seems like uh the more every time you learn something you realize you know much less which i guess describes science generally but it seems to yeah. really describe neurodegeneration it's really hard to get humans to do what you want them to do too they, they, they do not want to sit under a microscope as you uh stick their <laughs> no, brain it's really it. hard to like control like their that. diet and control their sleep cycles <laughs> control the medication they take and you know account for all of those other factors as well so let's circle background a little bit to neurospheres because they sounded cool and we like cool sounding things, especially when we've never heard of them before because I get to be educated and then I use them for a week and forget all about them again. So what are neurospheres and why are you looking at them? Alex, you want to go? Or... I mean, you can go if you want. <laughs> So neurospheres are basically 3D suspension culture models. So what you do is you dissect out your tissue and then dissociate them and then put it back in a dish in suspension. And what they do is like they just clump together to form nice, nice three-dimensional neurospheres. So similar to your organoid, but in a less sophisticated way, I would say. And um, yeah, what are the advantages? Like you can culture these neurospheres and then you can massage them to show their self-renewal capacity. So like, for instance, if you it's like certain population of tannocytes, they can go on forever, like more than like 10, 15 passages. Whereas like these certain subsets can go only until like seven, six or seven passages. And so that tells you whether they 
are like more stem cell like or more um, progenitor like th- that just gives you an Id- identification of that and you can also differentiate these neurospheres into your different neuronal subtypes and see if you can you know actually see these hypothalamic neurons come uh, differentiating from them so mm-hmm. it's cool in a way and you can look at all these hypothalamic specific genes and things the advantage is it's ex vivo and you can look at all genes and like look at these self renewability differentiation etc so yeah it's easy and cool which is what we want easy and cool easy and cool yeah they are the easy system to work with not too difficult to deal with yeah so primary cell culture basic easy as long as you don't mind coming in all the time and feeding them <laughs> over the weekend or, or, i mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was just gonna say like how long do you have them in culture because like organoids can take what like up to 90 days sometimes to develop so it's not as long as organoids it's like say for instance from day of dissection the neurosis forms within a week probably i thought right maximum yeah. a week should be enough for them to form neurospheres and you can start massaging them every week or so so and then yeah you can keep them going for months if you want to are they yeah. so they're proliferating and they've got they they got multiple cell types and stuff in as well or is it just one main one subtype Okay. Good question. Because organ, like for organoids, you get loads of different ones. They too, they are a heterogeneous population. They are a heterogeneous population. So, so yeah. But then, even then, I think while we know they're heterogeneous, but I think the conditions they're in are supposed to like restrict differentiation. So it might just yeah. be that they've they've got like they've slightly specialized, but but not very much, or become more restricted in what they can do. But the idea is that you're yeah. keeping you're keeping a number of like purish neural stem cells in the middle which may be like partially differentiating as they as they split but then w- what you do is you stick take the map suspension and stick them on a flat surface and take away some of the growth factors and hopefully make them become other stuff and so it was so cool looking down the microscope you've got these amorphous blobs of cells where everything looks the same and then you 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 make them flat and they grow into these cool uh, just neurons and astrocytes yeah neurons and astrocytes and stuff and you throw in a bunch of markers and you can see these pretty pictures down the microscope and i mean i i complained about the 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 system but actually i know it's better than other systems anyone who's worked with ipscs and stuff for will tell I me know. <laughs> I mean, Emma, Emma, i'm waiting for Emma to jump yeah on. i know <laughs> uh yeah so it's, they're not too bad uh, there's a reason i did my current screen in healer cells <laughs> i had, I'd had enough <laughs> after two years of my differentiation not working <laughs> Where do I find out about the different bioarchived licenses? This CC, BY, CDXY nonsense is driving me nuts. Hey, that bio have a resource for that? Ugh, that's your answer to everything. That's because they have everything you need to know about preprints. Sure, they probably have the basics, like info on the preprint service, but what else is there? There's so much more. Looking to post a preprint, but not sure what different journal policies are? They have a collection to help you out with that. There are meetings around preprints and associated services. If you want to know how preprint adoption has changed over time, there's even a page on that. And COVID? They have a big section on preprints and the pandemic, plus some really cool infographics for communicating preprints. And university policies? Surely they don't have that. They collect uni policies where possible. Okay, okay, they do sound pretty impressive, but is it not a bit of an echo chamber? It can be, but ASAP Bio also engage with people who don't love preprints and have concerns. So we had an excellent discussion on this very topic a couple of months ago. Oh, is there anything ASAP Bio don't do? Honestly, no, they're so nice over there. They were so quick to jump in and support this show. It's your one-stop shop for info on preprints and open science initiatives. So head over to asapbio.org to learn more and subscribe to their newsletter for the latest in preprint news. If you want a deeper dive into the world of preprints, then look out for the next recruitment of ASAP Bio Fellows. Okay, so we ask everyone why they preprinted, whose decision it was, and sort of their experiences around preprinting because it, it's you know the show's name and so we all get we, we get money for doing that. So how you know whose decision was driving the posting of the preprint? I think it was a combined decision. Once we submitted it to the journal of interest, we just then thought, okay, fine, we should put it in bio archive as well. So it was a combined decision between the authors, I think. And did you get did you get any sort of benefits from? pre-printing it or was it just to make it get it out there and, and make it accessible whilst it was going through the tedious peer review process the second one so just getting it out while <laughs> we are peer reviewing however long it took but luckily in yeah. our case it didn't take that long was it it was like only mere two three months so it was easier to get it there oh, that's quick so yeah and yeah, this is one of the few we're doing where we've, you've actually published yeah, it's out. whilst we're talking to you rather than a lot of them have now published after we've spoken to them which lets us ask a second question 
which is, did you see much differences between the preprint and the final published paper? Not much, actually. A bit, but not much. They just asked for a few bits and bobs. Like we did, In terms of experiments, we didn't have to do anything new or any fresh data. It's pretty much rearranging things and saying things in a better way. Basically. Yeah, we were, we were fortunate to have quite enthusiastic reviewers. Which I guess, Maybe, yeah. which, is, which is not the general experience. <laughs> but, <laughs> which we don't have all the yeah, time. Yeah, you're really selling peer review. You, yeah, this is no, not what I'm about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so actually, yeah, they 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 brought us up. I think all the all the comments they had were pretty good. Um, which is mostly around like changing the way that figures were put together and making sure that the figures were consistent and stuff like that, which is like something that when you've looked at these things for so long, you don't necessarily even think about. Um, and so I think I think in this instance, it, it, yeah, it worked quite well. Uh, but on the other hand, to big up preprints, like I'm I'm very happy it was preprinted because I, I've been a when I first heard about it, I was like, whoa, that's, a, that's such a crazy idea. <laughs> but you know, I think it's um, I think it's I think it's good because if we hadn't like if we posted it and then it hadn't got accepted, I mean, the, the work was still there. And so for me, who worked on this quite a long time ago now, I, I finished my PhD and um, uh, I submit my corrections in 2019. And so like, to, I didn't know if it was ever going to be published. And then we loaded more stuff with the, with the collaborators and Kavitha came on and did stuff. But at the time, I wasn't sure. And so for me, it was like, there was a marker. I don't need this for my career now, but it was really nice to have it there. And I was like, ah, the work I did is actually there. Is actually is actually there, and people can see it, yeah. which was um, which was really cool. And so I'm I'm glad it I'm glad it went up. And it's really helpful for when you need to go back and read it to remind <laughs> yourself what you actually did. Because I <laughs> put a paper out and forget instantly what any of it is about. Uh, yeah, most people get like lots changed. Yeah, it doesn't take long. But yeah, here we were fortunate enough not <laughs> to have much changed from our preprint to this final version. Yeah, good. Yeah, it sounds like a very nice process, which is what yes. ultimately we we want, which is good. And productive and helpful. That, mm. That's what peer review should be. Quick, helpful, nice <laughs> comment. Not demanding more lab work. But now we've pushed we, that I think point. if we tried to publish it after I finished my PhD, like I was very happy with where I finished my my PhD, but it wasn't ready for publication. Like it was, there was a very subtle phenotype we'd looked at from two directions and one of them we didn't have enough data on to be convincing about. <laughs> and so then, to, so to then have like Kavita come in and do a load of like, build up the evidence base of stuff from with our lab so it's like to really finish stuff off rather than where other than where i left it and then also to bring in the collaborators so seth blackshaw's lab and then joe lewis and fred ebling are... they have been very helpful and great yeah, very, yeah. Very, very um like it's actually it's like ah oh, I, I i was i was convinced there was a phenotype when i left it but i knew it would be hard to sell whereas with all of these other different types of evidence you're like okay no there really is we can look at it many different ways and, and see the same thing the, the same subtle thing many different ways so yeah i think um I, I was very happy with where it ended up and i like to think that that was one of the reasons that that uh publication went okay as well which i mean that's a really good point because of course like you said not wanting to stay in academia you don't have that pressure to get a paper because it's nice to get one out everyone wants to to share their work with it. people that's why we do it but if you're staying in academia there's a huge pressure to get your paper out and when you're working on something where i mean emma works with stem cells that take an age to work with i'm doing a lot of mouse work at the moment which takes an age to do and when you're working on something like that where you can't do it quickly mm -hmm. you've only got three years as a contract to get stuff out and it's not always possible to do that so you know it really goes to show that the the current system is not it doesn't work it anymore a, it is a hard work not really to get anything out you just like i said you need to be at the right time at the right space of time so to get anything done because if you have everything set up for you you just walk in and do your experiments boom it works otherwise you just have to like set up everything on your own and that takes forever yeah i mean yeah setting up new labs as well <laughs> <Hard work. laughs> it's an arse it's a massive arse having done that now that leads us nicely into a Kavitha question. So you obviously your your plans are to stay in academia, try and try and get your own lab and do your own stuff. You've done a lot of different things. One of the things, so you know, you you used to work with one of mm -hmm. my PhD supervisors as a postdoc. You've worked with Marisha. You've kind of bounced around yes. a lot of the different labs at Sheffield. You worked with Emma, and you know, you've worked across a lot of different things too. You've not you've done the thing I like, which is to jump across mm -hmm. and get varied experience rather than sticking into one thing so how is that how have you found that how has that benefited being a postdoc it has actually i mean honestly i'm kind of person who 
you know, gets kind of bored after a while of doing the same thing again and again for a long time. I don't know if it's the right thing to say it out loud, but um, so having doing different projects at different periods of time has like actually helped me to focus on what I actually like in the sense like I have tried different things now. So okay, fine, I've done some bit of basic developmental biology, some translational work and some neuroscience stuff, etc. So everything has like now pinned me down to this bit where I can use all those like uh, experience that I have gained I think to see where I want to go next so which is useful actually I think it's a good exercise rather than just following that up in mm. one go for me definitely it has been useful as well I would say I don't know about others yeah I always argue that it, it's it's a good experience because like it, it is you learn new techniques and you learn new ways of you know doing experiments and things right rather than just doing your gold standard experiment day in and day out because working with Martin's lab was like totally eye-opening for me I've never done like western blot in my life before but it, it all worked and it all you know like so it gave me the right experience that I needed I think so it was wonderful definitely definitely a western blot that worked no, I was going to say that. Like, what is this magic? <laughs> <laughs> Teach us your ways. <laughs> so switching away from that, leaving academia as someone who is very much going down that path, I imagine it to be this green, rosy, amazing, happy place where everyone skips everywhere, um, which is probably not true at all. Not true. <laughs> <laughs> so how have you found that, Alex, as a as a step? I imagine it's quite different to being in academia. Yeah, it is. Um and I think it'll be different for different disciplines within academia. But I, so I, I realized about halfway through my PhD that I w didn't want to stay in academia after I was doing my PhD. I'm still very glad that I did it. And it still informs the way that I do my current job, even though I don't do anything to do with neuroscience whatsoever. I still, everything I do on a daily basis is informed by what I learned during my PhD. And so I think it was incredibly valuable. And I think that the skills that PhDs PhD candidates develop are extremely useful outside of academia as well, um, even though it's not necessarily apparent what they are until you leave. <laughs> I think it's very difficult to know when you're inside, ac inside academia what it's like outside. And so I, I've definitely had a positive experience. I know that it was a very good decision for me. Uh, I've tried not to be too evangelical to my friends who stayed in academia, like all of you guys and many others as well, because I know that different, different strokes for different folks, like different things work for different types of people. Um, for me, it was great. I struggled through parts of my PhD with um, like you work an experiment for a really long time and it wouldn't work. And then you work an experiment for a really long time and it wouldn't work. And so one of the fundamental parts of my PhD work, I didn't manage to replicate until two and a half years in. And then suddenly everything fit together and the, the last year and a half went amazing. But like at times it was a struggle because of just the crushing failure of nothing working forever. Was... My, my entire second year, I, when I present my PhD, well, not that I do anymore, but when I present my PHD work, I have a slide just a single slide to summarize my second year and it's just all failed 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 yeah. didn't show anything i think that's 80 percent of people that's how phds goes as far as phds goes i think that's that's normal <laughs> yeah yeah and uh i i just for me that that way of working wasn't great um <laughs> not um, like i know it's important but it didn't work very well with the way that i motivate myself and so i'm when i the first thing I did when I moved out was moved into a kind of, um, I joined the civil service as an operational researcher, which is something that someone who does like a, a combination of technical problem solving and then kind of like business management, project management type stuff. It's all a bit nebulous, but I, I did a role that was involved in like stat being a statistician and doing data science and like, and that was a way that I could ask researchy type questions and do stuff, but I'd get my answers within minutes. <laughs> like I'd write some code and when the code wouldn't work, that was fine because I could <laughs> I'd know immediately that the code hadn't worked and I could go back and write it again. Uh, and so it's just a different way of a different way of doing research type stuff and so I do all kinds of things now but my favorite things to do are still research it's just different systems no longer mouse brains it's it's other stuff like looking at building a model of recruitment to teacher training or doing behavior doing some behavioral science research looking at social media you know it, it, different things and more I guess more direct outcomes you actually you know you, you produce something quickly you have an answer quickly so you can kind of actual influence is happening quicker than yeah yeah I think, that's, I think that's true and so i i wanted one of the reasons i wanted to do a phd was because i wanted to make it i wanted to do something that felt like it would make a difference and there's there's some hubris involved there but i think also it's a thing that a lot of people share is like they want to feel like they've, they've left a mark on things and also like, like i did feel like this work that we did wasn't is important and it is important it's a really important paper go and read it go and recommend it to your friends <laughs> like it's a great paper uh, the work we did was really really valuable but also i like having effect on like Working in public policy means you you can have an effect 
on things in the in the immediate term and so like the modeling i was doing looking at recruitment teacher training meant that we could say well actually the num the numbers aren't looking so good at the moment let's try and change the num like how can we try and increase the number of people who can be recruited to history teacher training this year like are there something we can do about it now and so when you when you see that immediate effect it is it, it feels like feels like you're making a difference um but then again there's lots of different types of job outside academia where you do different types of things i know other people who leave and go into the pharmaceutical industry we all know people <laughs> who go and work at the dark side of the pharmaceutical industry <laughs> Yeah, we all know but no, like, and you can you can do things there as well. Uh, translational research, whether inside or outside academia, um, can have more of an apparent effect than the basic research, despite the basic research also being fundamental. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I was locked out of my new flat this morning, so I sat and tweeted about how great a new startup in the US is, uh, Okaja Science. So, and we're going to probably have those on at some point to plug plug all about that. Um, but yeah, it's clearly there's space for a podcast talking about people who've left academia. That was, uh, <laughs> I'm hearing there's a need. Can I, uh, can I John, jump we, in with something? Yeah, yeah, jump in. So yeah, I was going to say, so if you, I guess it's one of those, you know, knowing what you know now sort of things, but if you, if you could go back and talk to sort of just deciding to leave academia, Alex, and be like, right, with the rest of your PhD, you need to spend the time feathering your nest with skills that were useful down the line. What would you, what would you go back and tell him to, to do? Uh, I suspect I have a few guesses for what you might say but let's let's see well realistically um it wouldn't really matter what i said because i wouldn't have done anything different anyway <laughs> I, I think I think I find it very easy to be motivated by the things I need to do and quite hard to go away and learn new things. And so uh, I was very bad at going away and doing the trumpet practice I needed to do when I was a kid and I was learning to play the trumpet. I'm very bad at going away and learning Lithuanian, which is something I'm supposed to have supposed to have been doing for years. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm also I'm also not great at going. I wanted to do coding and programming and stuff when I was doing my PhD, but there was no immediate use for it. And so I was very bad at like, making time to do it. And so that's one of the things I'd like to do because I thought I'd be quite good at it. It turns out I, I was okay at it as well. And I, I'd like to do more of it. It's just that my job's moving in a different direction. And so I think that's generally a skill that people who do academic research probably get on with quite well because it's just a way of asking questions and getting a machine to give you an answer. And the the syntax of it and like the way in which the logical way in which you can construct arguments and questions is quite similar to the way in which we think about how systems work in, in biology. And so that's something I'd like to do more of. But generally, I think the most important thing wouldn't have been about learning new things. It's about understanding how the skills that we had from our PhDs are useful, whether that's within research generally or outside. And like not just being able to do a Western blot or being able to do different types of experiments but understanding how you learn like how you learn different types of experiments or how you go about writing a scientific argument or giving a good presentation you know that kind of stuff everything everyone has to do as part of their academic work whether they're a phd student or, or at a later stage and so um understanding those things is really valuable and so something that i do now is i help i'm on the committee for the civil service systems thinking interest group which is about bringing civil servants together to kind of learn about systems thinking and that's how how you think about problems inside systems and so as for government like understanding the systems at play in, in, in fixing policy problems is really important. And it turns out it's really like this the systems thinking is basically the only thing you do when you're doing a, when you're doing research is understanding systems and how your little part of the your little part is actually affected by all the other things that fit into it, particularly if you're trying to figure out why an experiment doesn't bloody work. <laughs> Um, you have to know about all of the other factors that fit in as well. And so, um, yeah, uh, when I first learned about it, I was like, oh, this is this is great. It's the way my brain works. I want to do more of this. And so one of the things I'm trying to do at the moment is um, working with some other people to build a systems thinking curriculum for other analysts and others who want to learn about how, how they can, uh, within the civil service, and how they can kind of bring more of it into their policy making. Because I think it's a really valuable skill that w researchers develop just by doing the research, but actually is something that's applicable to everyday life. Good question there, John. I think I've run out of questions. I don't think I've got anything else to ask. I think I've got two bits to end on. Well, so we got, we were a little bit excited when we first started the talk here, because we know you both. I mean, we, we, we all met up with Alex the other weekend to get drunk together. For, for his birthday, not just because we're sad, just to be clear. <laughs> for his birthday, yeah. But I mean, I, I haven't seen mm -hmm. Kavitha for years um, since we were in, since I was in Sheffield, actually. So we, we were a little bit excited and got carried away with being able to chat to you both. So we kind of skipped over the fun facts you provide. And I, I really like the fun facts because it, I think it's nice to get an insight into people who, you know, they're not just scientists, they have lives and they do fun stuff. But also, when we have people on we know, I always learn something. So I, we had Hannes on a little while ago and I learned something from his fun fact I didn't know about him jo we did a practice episode when we first started with John and I think I learned something then as well that would never see the light of day <laughs> <laughs> I heard it <laughs> yeah, you oh, did, yeah you did yeah so I, 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 do, I do really like the fun facts and yet again I 
I think actually I might have known Alex's fun fact. But so Alex's fun fact was that you used to be an extra for films and TV. Mm. It's kind of quite cool, actually. Wow! What, were, what were you in? Where can we find you? Well, so I used to live. I used to live quite close to where Pinewood Studios is, and also mm. there's loads of other studios in London. And so I was part of a, a children's extras agency, so where they just provide extras, particularly extra children, to, to be in the background of, um, of films. Have and you TV. got any extra children? Extra, yeah, exactly. Pretty much. Pretty much. Um, so yeah, so I was in. Um, I was in a very bad rendition of Robin Hood that was produced by um, Russell Crowe, featuring Russell Crowe and directed by Ridley Scott and Kate Blanchett. There's a famous tree in that from uh, Northumberland, from where I am, actually. So there you go. We're right. connected. I, I know someone I know someone who was an extra in the, in the beach fighting scene, someone running down the beach with a shield. I know someone from home that was in that scene as an extra. So there you go. Anybody else here? Anyone else here know anybody in that film or trees no, in that I... film? I'm still impressed that you were in a Russell Crowe film. (laughs) I know. Yeah, exactly. We just stopped at that Russell Crowe then. I spent spent an afternoon with Kate Blanchett. She was very nice. What? Uh, Wow, nice. Gladriel. (laughs) So my brother did much better. My brother was much more successful at this extering. In fact, it was almost not extering. He was on the West End um, in Oliver and, oh, The Wizard of Oz, I believe, and used to understudy for Oliver and was all very nearly like Oliver on the West End at one point. So you didn't push him down the stairs to get the lead lead role then? (laughs) no. No, but he, um, uh, in a film called The Other Berlin Girl, played uh, the son of Eddie Redmayne and Scarlett Johansson and had lunch, like, just kind of like two on two with Scarlett Johansson with him, my mum, and uh, Scarlett Johansson's bodyguard. <laughs> so that worked really well. And yet now he's an accountant. So, you know. <laughs> oh, nice. Good fun fact. Well, I mean, we just learned loads about Alex. Yeah, he's so many more questions. So Kavitha's fun fact, though, also really good and kind of, you know, again, creative kind of stuff that that you know we don't often think of scientists doing so you you dance and you, you're also on i can't remember what the cricket name team name is but the yorkshire yeah we play for the south yorkshire women and girls cricket league yeah it's fun so yeah we started only last year though so i've always been an ardent fan of cricket like you know no surprise there asians <laughs> indians coming from a cricket background but no always watched it but like never got around to play but like last year we started off so we have like our own cricket team in sheffield which is part of the yorkshire and derbyshire cricket league where the men's used to play like my husband plays for this league called sheffield super kings and last year we started a women's division and uh, so we've been really good at it actually we won like the plate uh, cup last time and this year this is the second season in and doing really good. So yeah, that is one of my exciting you've achievements. Win, you've got to win again. I know we should. There's too much pressure now. <laughs> so the fun fact is because like your um, ECB, the English Cricket Board, is like pushing women in cricket and mm. uh, women and girls mainly into cricket. They just like do all these charity events and things. So last year I had an opportunity to go meet, um, play for this charity event between Parliament versus Yorkshire. And uh, Ian Botham was the chief guest. I don't know if you guys know Ian Botham. He's this famous English cricketer and David Gower. And I told Andy that I met both of them because Andy watches cricket a lot. He was well <laughs> jealous. He was like, I can't believe you went. I just sent them a picture of me and both of them and they would go. He was like, can't believe you went and met him. So yeah, that, that was fun. So great. So that's what I'm doing. So we do like have a few girls team now. So looking at like young girls and boys we started a new young uh, under nine team as well. So they are playing cricket. So it's more of a community coming together. Mm. So, and I'm a committee member of the uh, kids league. So one of them, um, I sit on the committee. So Ben just said cricket league for under nines and under tens. Yeah, that's my few of my achievements outside academia. I would say. Who would have thought we'd end on such a famous connection there? I know. Next time, yeah, you can you can see me on this television. I'll wave at you. Does he does he both have uh, have Twitter? Can we tag him in the uh, in the episode <laughs> launch tweet? <laughs> All I've got is the bloody Robin Hood tree. That's no fun. <laughs> yeah, they've shown you up, Johnny. And it's not even it's not even my tree. I've just stood next to it once. All right, I think I think that's it. I think that's it. I think we're done. But we have to say that you've been an amazing host and um, I'm sure you'll do good editing, John. <laughs> uh, thanks, Emma, for approaching us to do this. It's a good opportunity. Never done this before. Feels like celebrating, huh? <laughs> it's been really lovely to have you on and like catch up a little bit. I mean, I see Alex all the time, but I don't see you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. We should all have a Sheffield catch up once. Yeah. When you come down to Sheffield next. Yeah, cool. If I, if I, ever, if I run, ever run away from academia, I'm going to go, you know, 
chicken farm or something on the outskirts of Sheffield. So yeah, I'll see you back. <laughs> Sheffield is beautiful and lovely. It is. I, I really it, miss it. Yeah, I miss we, the hills. See, I've, I've just in my entire life, I've just been in two places. One in Chennai, back home in India, and then I came moved to Sheffield. I haven't moved out of Sheffield, so this is like my second home. Well, you know, all of us who've moved out of Sheffield. I think I'm speaking for all of us who've moved out of Sheffield. Deeply regret it. We all want to go back. It's such a lovely, <laughs> nice it is city. Lovely. <laughs> it's, it's got the perfect balance of everything, I think. So I do miss it. And I do. And I do. Uh, it's nice to see all you guys again to, to have us on the show. It's been really, really great. It feels very friendly. <laughs> and coming in and seeing, seeing some friendly faces on the other side, it's not like a, going into an interview board. So, yeah, thanks very much for hosting us and for letting us discuss our work. Literally, I was like all afternoon. My, now, luckily, my experiment failed this afternoon. So, hey for science. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting use of the word luckily. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, I had time to like go through stuff and do, you know, actually read the paper once again. So, to give you the right answers. Well, I, I, I think I've said this a few times, but I we had a paper out last year and I was on Radio 4 for it. And they asked me a question. I give them the wrong information. So it's really good <laughs> to go back and read the paper. Yes, definitely. To refresh your memory of what you did before you talk yeah. about it. And you don't have to send out an awkward tweet being like, oh, after, I'm way, so sorry, right. everyone. I was wrong. <laughs> All right. I think that's it. I think that's it. Thanks very much for hosting us and for letting us discuss our work. It's been really lovely to have you on. Okay. And that is the show. If you enjoyed listening, then hit that subscribe button for more and leave us a review on whatever platform it is you're listening on. You can reach out to us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsinmotion.com. Didn't enjoy that? Well, we're all scientists here, so send us your review and let us know what works or what you'd like to hear more of, or less of. But until next time, have a good week.